All right, everyone. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. You know, really, really looking forward to this topic, especially as we're kind of halfway through the year here. Um, you know, really, really trying to set set you guys up with with a solid plan, and you know, really give you some some insight to finish the year strong. Um, so, you know, some some of you may be a Cycle CPA client. If not, I'm Joe Policastro, one of the co-founders of Cycle CPA, along with with Carl Policastro. Um, and uh, you know, we we do anything from bookkeeping to CFO services. We we work fully remotely, and we work with uh, you know companies all throughout the country doing the accounting. And you know, really, we want to bring the the accounting perspective right to to your business here. And try to shed some light on some of the some of the cash outflows and, and expenses that maybe you don't consider on a day to day basis. Um, you know that that you may see to you know if 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 some of these are improved, it can really make a difference to your to your bottom line. And uh, you know it's also nice to see. And thanks for thanks for you know mentioning in the chat what what your revenue mix is. Um, in regards to the services, that helps to give us an idea. Um, see a lot of a lot of familiar names. Um, yeah. So looking forward to to diving in here. Yeah. Hey, Joshua and Eddie. Nice to have you guys. Nice to have everybody. Yeah. No, I'm super excited for this one, Joe. It's just because hidden costs are not things that you see physically on a piece of paper or able to like kind of monetarily uh, look at, but. We'll uh, uncover some of those, so that's that's great. Awesome, and I would say one of one of the biggest hidden costs is something that's as as Carla mentioned. This is something that 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 you don't necessarily see on your financials, right? You don't you don't necessarily measure sometimes a move that that you don't make within your business, right? A, a lot of the things that that you analyze and look at are based on actions that that you do take but what is the cost to not take that certain action within your business right how much will it cost you not to like in these examples invest in better equipment hire some of the key staff um, invest in education some of the technology um, so it's a it's a different way to kind of think right and here's a here's a simple example where where you look at what is the opportunity cost of, you know, of marketing, right? And paid marketing versus maybe just word of mouth marketing. And there's nothing wrong with businesses being able to grow through word of mouth. But how much is it costing you not to spend money on marketing or not to allocate time and resources to marketing, especially, you know, these past few years, um, you know, I know companies have been getting a lot of jobs and contracts and, um, you know, now things are not as, uh, you know, may not be flowing in as, as fast as they were these, these, these past few years. So, um, you know, but in, in this example, you can see both companies starting the year with the same revenue figure as a, as a million. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, you know, getting the same through word of mouth in, increase in revenue of 150,000, but company B, they add 300,000 through, through paid marketing, right? So this is, this is a simple example of, you know, what, it, what is the opportunity cost of, of putting in that paid marketing to place three, 300,000 in revenue, right? So there, there is a cost of, sometimes not making a certain move within your business. And, uh, you know, an, another common example is maybe implementing a software for, for your company, right? So really thinking about some of the moves within your company in terms of the, the, the opportunity cost. And this is going to come up more times as well with, within these, um, you know, within this presentation. So definitely something to think about. And then missed missed opportunities, right? So what are what are some ways that you can leverage some of the relationships and other 
businesses within your community to to use and subcontract out some of the work, whether it's work that's that needs to be done before your work is done or after or 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 during and putting yourself in the position where you can take take part financially in, in you know some some of that gain all right so um, thinking about that we we work with a lot of clients that have a very profitable um, business where they subcontract out a lot of their work so it's it's definitely something you can do um, and then upselling and cross-selling right um, this this has an enormous impact on the profitability of a company and when you look at the profits of a company, it's it's always beneficial to increase the lifetime value of a customer. How much are you going to get from that customer over time? And there's a there's a statistics where the expenses that are associated with providing an upsold service could be forty to sixty percent of the typical business expenses incurred in delivering the initial service, right? So what does that mean? This, this calculation down here is an example of that, right? Because if you're going to do an upsell, it's going to be the same amount of some of the ad, ad administrative and overhead expenses because you're, you're traveling that same distance, right? So when you look at all of that non non billable time, that's not going to change as much. Yeah, you might spend a little bit more time at the property, but all of the other aspects of it, you know that that's why it could be literally half of, half the amount of expenses rather than going and trying to get new business. And in in this example, um, you you can see both companies start off with the with the same amount of revenue. However. They both reach 1.4 million eventually, but in different ways. Company A, they they add on that that 400,000 by adding on new customers, right? And company B, they do it through upsells. So the so company A ends up having more customers. However, the expenses that are added on with that extra 400,000 in revenue is the same ratio as it was for, for the company before, right? When it was getting new clients and the resulting net profits 15%. However, company B, by doing upsells, you can see that they actually have the same amount of customers. But, but the expenses that, that were added, as mentioned up here, even looking at it in a very conservative view of 60% of, of these expenses, right? Their profitability is a lot better at the end of the day, right? So it's, it's something that you definitely want to consider upselling. Um, it's, it's definitely an opportunity that you know, we see a lot of companies not, not taking advantage of. And, you know, even if you're not going to be doing the work, like I said, maybe there's a subcontractor that, that you can work with and really develop a relationship with. Because sometimes it's, it's those extra upsells and services and work that you're subcontracting out that a lot of that ends up going right to your bottom line because you're, you're already paying for a lot of the fixed expenses. So, um, you know, so, and so it will cost me less to gain a client from upselling because exactly. there's less expenses associated with an upsell than it is with an adding client on because of just the other administrative work that's involved with adding a new client. Absolutely. Yeah. And even even when you look at it through through the marketing expense of getting a client, which we're going to go over customer retention later on. But, you know, th yeah, it's 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 definitely something that can really impact your your profits. So. It's cool. Awesome. So next thing we're going to talk about is 
cash flow and and how that really um, is hidden right within within your your financial picture. Now, what we have here is three companies, you know, operating from two percent all the way to ten percent, and really. Um, you're going to be able to see your revenue on your financial statement, right? And you see your net income, you know, like let's take the one that's making 2% net net profit, um, 2% of a million, 20,000. What you don't see and what's hidden is how much you're going to have to pay on taxes at the end of the year, right? And on average, small business owners pay 37% of their net profit on taxes, right? So pretty much if you take your $20,000 in net profit and you multiply that by 37%, you're looking at a $7,400 tax bill at the end on average, right? And so your net profit after tax, so the $20,000 minus what you have to pay to the IRS is $12,600. Um, so that's definitely something hidden that you have to consider um, when you are doing business and estimating and really building out the structure of, of what kind of profitability you wanna hit, right? So this company that's making 2%, now they're down to 12,600, right? Profit after tax. But then you have to cover your debt. Right. So you have those Sheffield, Ford loans, equipment, truck loans that you have each year. And for this company, they pay out thirty thousand dollars in loan payments for the year. So you see twelve thousand six hundred minus thirty thousand that I have to pay out in loan payments cash available. That leaves me at seventeen thousand four hundred in the in the hole negative for the year. So that means I'm going to have to get a working capital loan or something to cover that uh, negative cash flow position that I'm in. Of course, you don't want to be in a negative cash flow position, right? You want to be in a positive. That means that whatever you start the year with $500 in the bank, you end the year with $1,000 in the bank, right? You want to increase um, your bank account balance. So when you assess all of like the debt service, what you have to pay in loans, and what you're going to have to pay out to the IRS each year, that that should guide what your profitability goal is within your company, right? So this company that's 2% net income is just not going to cut it, right, for for their debt service and, and what they're spending on taxes. As you can see, um, We did the same thing with 5%. I mean, it gets a little bit better with 5% profit. You know, you're left with 1,500, but not ideal. Ultimately, you wanna be at at least 10% net income. And and this is the reason why. It's because you wanna be able to cover your loans plus cover your taxes at the end of the year and be left over with $33,000, right, in the bank. Um, Added amount to your bank account balance. So that's why profitability is is so important. And, you know, really just to wrap this up, don't forget about taxes. And you could even use that 37% uh, rough rough number, you know, or you can ask your tax professional to help you out with that. But that's just the average. And then also make sure you take your loan payments into consideration when you are looking for a profit goal for your business. Yeah, so the next thing was we're going to look at a cash flow statement for company A and company B. And the reason why we want to look at this is to kind of look at opportunities and improvement between the two companies and how they're not like utilizing their cash in the business. And so company A is making 15% net profit. So if you see up at the top on the, on the left, but at the end of the period, company A only retained 7% of that profit in their bank account. So in their bank account, they end up with 52,500, if you can see on the bottom there. Yeah, 
And then um, company B has 12% profit, right? So less profit than company A, but company B is so much better at retaining money. They retain 9% of their total profit. So they end the period with $71,000. So I rather be company B than company A because even though company B has less profit, Company B is able to retain more money in their bank account and have a higher uh, cash um, cash flow percentage in their bank. So they have 9% and company A only has 7%. Okay. And so some of the, re so now I want to compare the two companies. Like why is company B performing so much better and has so much more cash than company A? One of the reasons is because company B is better at collecting accounts receivable. So if you all see under cash from operating activities, um, decrease in accounts receivable 45,000 while the operating activities for company A is 60,000. So, you know, they have less AR. Um, and this is something that you have to ask yourself as a business owner, do I have a process to collect my outstanding invoices for my clients, right? And I know when you all start out or if you're, you know, just are new, um, it could be a little bit scary to, to kind of cut ties with, with some of your clients that may not be paying on time or make that difficult phone call, but it's something that, you know, is expected. It's a totally normal thing. You're not a bank at the end of the day and with interest rates being so high right now, you don't wanna be a bank and not get paid for it, right? Um, and so it's important to have clear expectations for with the client from day one and have it in your contract and then have a policy. So what we recommend is that you go into your system um, where you're invoicing out of and look at your accounts receivable at least once per week. And you have notes there for your clients. So um, Mrs. Jones said she was going to pay me today. They will pay me next Friday. Whatever it is, or you left message, left the voicemail, whatever it is, the status is for that week. Um, and that way you're at, on top of your AR and you're holding the the client accountable, you know, for what they owe you. And what we recommend is if they don't pay you um, after one month, then you should just stop services because there's a cost associated with not getting paid and still obviously still performing the service. You have to pay your workers to go out to that property. You're paying gas, you're paying all of these expenses without being paid yourself. And so after one month is what we see um, that you you stop uh, services, but before that month, you want to contact the client at least three to four times. So maybe one time was a phone call, the second time was a text, the third time was a letter, and you want to get more intense in your verbiage. So the last one should be like, okay, in order for us to prevent a service cancellation, please pay now kind of a thing so that they know this is the last time you'll be reaching out to them. And again, it's nothing that is out of the ordinary. It's a it's a policy that we have and we help business owners implement. And let's say that you're not the one that's doing the accounts receivable, then you will let your office administrator, your AR person, they have to follow this process each week and make sure that they're following up. So that's really what company B is doing better at than, than company A. And that right there, even if you say, oh, I'm, I'm going to speed up my accounts receivable by two days, like you get paid two days earlier from each one of your clients than you did in the past, it may not sound like a lot, but it makes a huge difference in having that money in the bank um, two days or three days earlier because the earliest you can have it, it, it will match your expenses, how your, um, when your payroll comes out and all of this stuff. So it does make a difference. Um, and that's what it's showing here. So another thing is 
accounts payable. So an ideal company will receive their payments from their clients. And then after that, they will pay their vendors, right? That's an ideal situation. So let's say that you receive payment from clients within 30 days, and then you pay your accounts payable in 35 days, five days after you receive payment. Um, that's a normal cash flow cycle because you, you're getting the money in and then you're expending it out after you have it. But you don't want the reverse. And I see this a lot in this industry where it's the reverse. People are paying their vendors with 30 days and not receiving payments from their clients within 35 days. And that's that's backwards. We don't want to do that because that could put you in a cash flow crunch. Um, and so really, that's how you want to manage that. Um, and then the next thing we see is depreciation. So you can see company A has more depreciation expense than company B. And that's because company B knows how to utilize their assets and they have good asset management. So what that means is they know exactly when to buy equipment, what type of equipment to buy for the services that they're providing. Um, and they you know, have some, you know, they have uniformed equipment where they know how to utilize it. They have training for it and so on and so forth. So they're able to spend less on it because of training. They match their equipment with their services and they know exactly the capacity of each equipment purchase that they have. And that's what you see here is that company B spends a little bit less on their equipment purchase. You see company B spends 25,000, company A spent 30,000 because they're smarter at um, purchasing that equipment, like I said. So the next one is cash from financing activities. Um, company B has less loans out. They're only paying $15,000 a year in loans and company A is paying 20,000. So that's another thing is like you want to be um, kind of you want to see how much debt you can take on in the business and you don't want to take on too much debt and just be smart with with your payments because every payment that you add on each month, like we saw in the previous example, is just going to drain your bank account balance. So that's that. Oh, all in all. Managing a good accounts receivable process, accounts payable, smart with asset purchases, and just um, taking out less in loans. This is why company B is doing so much better retaining cash in the business. Yeah, and I think the accounts receivable and collections, I think that's a, that's a common thing, common area of opportunity for sure. Um, and as Carla mentioned, starts with um, a process that's set in place, especially if you have a team member that's in charge of that, you know, making sure that they understand what the expectations are, but also making sure that that, that your clients understand what what the expectations are as well when when you start the work. And, you know, when it when it comes to looking at the financials, you always want to think about, OK, what 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 actions have the biggest influence that, that I can do over the company's profitability and financial health over, over time. So really you would want to start with the items like in a, in a green industry company, looking at things like assets and also the, the staff, right? Those are, those are two huge aspects of the company. So do the assets that your company has trucks, equipment, do they line up with, the jobs that are at at hand, and because you, what what you may have in place early on in your company or early on when you start a, ser a service line or a division might be different from what you actually need right now in your company. And an example of that is maybe a company did a lot of residential work in the past, um, and because of some of the confinements and you know the way a residential property is laid out, maybe you, you didn't need as big of a mower or, you know, as intensive of equipment, but now you're starting to go into more commercial work 
you know, are you trying to use some of that equipment that is not going to be efficient for you on some of those larger jobs? And, you know, it could, it could seem like a decent idea at first, you know, but, you know, really you want to focus on, you know, anything you can do that's, that's in your control to improve efficiencies, you want to take advantage of because there's enough things in business that will happen to you. You know, someone, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of things and we're not going to list them out, <laughs> but you know, you want to really think about all the things that, that, that you can control. Right. Yeah. And I, I um, had a business owner ask me um, because they were looking to implement a new service line and they wanted to buy a large piece of equipment and they said, well, should I, should I do that because I'm going to get into it or, or should I wait? And my answer to that, it's always like the equipment will be there to, for you to purchase. Just start off your service line and see uh, the demand for it first. There's, and do the equipment rental route. And then when you're, when, when you see that excessive demand and you actually need the piece of equipment, then go out and buy it. So that way you're not stuck with something that you're not going to use, or maybe you didn't enjoy, or just the market's not there for, for the services that you're offering. Yeah. And always before you make a move like that, and you're going to add a fixed, fixed expense, always think twice about that. Because that's what's going to that that's how companies get into trouble with cash flow, right? So always think twice about that. If if and you know we're going to talk more more about that in a in a few minutes here, but you know also when it comes to employees, right? Does the work that your employee is doing do, does it match up with their with their specific level of expertise and and their pay rate, right? And when you think about hidden costs of a company, yeah, sure. It may not look like you're losing money if one of your managers is doing minimum wage work, but in reality you are. And what are you losing? You're, you're losing the, probably the difference in pay rate from maybe someone at $18 an hour can be doing that work, but you have someone at $30 an hour doing it. So you're losing $12 an hour. So that's a hidden cost, right? So always thinking about, Okay, how can we, you know, whether it's assets, right, whether it's people, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, it's it's being allocated appropriately and it's working on the the right, you know, tasks that are that are being done in the business. Yeah, like I had a business owner tell me that their manager goes out and buys the materials for for the jobs. And you know, I didn't, I didn't think that was a good idea because your manager, you want them, you pay them a lot of money, right? And they should be working on the higher level tasks like project management, um, you know, talking with clients, uh, talking with employees and stuff like that. You don't want to pay somebody like that to go fetch materials, right? So kind of that's what that's what we're saying with employees tasks to line up with their pay rate. You want some, somebody on with a lower skill level and pay them less to kind of run and fetch the materials for you. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes it's good to, you know, if you feel that, that, that things are getting a little out of hand in regard to that, sometimes it's good to, to reference their job description or, or remember why you initially hired them in the first place. Right. So just, just some things to, to consider. And if you guys have any questions, please put it in the chat because that's why we're here. That's why we're here live as well. So, so we can answer questions, um, you know, so please, you know, use the chat to ask, ask your questions. We're, we're here to help you guys. So, um, and on the, on the topic of, of assets, also thinking about utilization, right? How, when, how often are, are these assets being, being utilized in your company, right? Is it, is it 60%, 70% of the time? And, Typically, companies that have a lower return, you know, make a make a lower net profit for the amount of assets that they have. Typically, they they also have a low asset utilization, right? So, it's it's always something to to consider as you're scaling, as you're growing, right? Um, you know, are we are we looking okay? And 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 there's some some ratios that we calculate as well in, in regard to the balance sheet return on fixed assets, which is one of them. 
that 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 will have a pretty good indicator here as well. And utilization of of assets, you know, it can it can vary at, at times, especially in a seasonal business, um, you know, and even when comparing different kinds of equipment, right? If you have a more uh, a piece of equipment that's used specifically for only one type of job versus other equipment, like maybe in a, in a maintenance company, the, the, the mowers, those are always being used, right? So um, sometimes it's okay to, to have, you know, lower asset utilization depending on the type of equipment, right? If it's more, if it's a more specialized piece of equipment. Um, and then also thinking about things like maintenance and downtime, right? So these are a lot of those, those hidden things that can quickly eat away at, at, at some of the profits. So um, definitely something to, to consider here. And one of the common questions we get, common questions I would say towards, towards the end of the year typically is, you know, should we, should we buy some, some assets to uh, um, lower tax liability, right? One thing, first off, is, you know, you, you want to make sure that, um, you know, your, your assets are generating a net, net profit. You also want to understand that you know, the amount that, that you pay in taxes at the end of the year, that is a direct correlation to the success that you had that year, right? So it's not always a bad thing. And you can utilize the after-tax profit to invest in other, asp other aspects of your company that are going to help you grow. Mm -hmm. if, there's one things, if there's one thing that companies have in common that are able to grow even at a, at a faster rate, they're profitable. And they're not investing in equipment that they really don't need, that they're maybe just trying to lower their tax liability, right? And here's an example, the, the company over to the left, you can see that they they were profitable year one, two, and three, total after tax profit, 133,250, return on fixed assets was 15%, right? So that's, that's the net income over the fixed assets was 15% for that company. Now, some some companies, as I mentioned, they would rather, no matter what the cost, they would rather pay zero in taxes, right? So the company to the right, they invested all of it into assets, right? So the total after tax profit was zero, return on fixed assets was 6%. Now, the company to the, to, to the left, they're able to take that 133,000 and invest that into actual things within their business that are going to drive revenue and growth. Whereas the only thing the company to the right accomplished was taking up more room in their yard with more equipment. Right? So, you know, and this is why it's good to know some of your numbers in regard to what's on your balance sheet with, with the assets and the returns that you're getting on there. Um, because it's, it's, you know, numbers don't lie in that sense. Right. So, so it'll show you, um, you know, even in regard to, um, you know, maybe what, what the industry averages are and different things like that. But, you know, I think that, that this is a hidden cost of, you know, buying assets at the end of the year, right? And yeah. what it what it actually does to your company. Yeah. And I was on a call the other day with a client and they had done that for multiple years, Joe, back to back. And their return on the fixed assets was low, like nowhere near what industry average should be. We want to have high return on assets because this industry is driven by assets, equipment and, and, and vehicles, right? Well, this is a huge metric for this industry. You want to, you know, hit the hit the benchmark with this one for sure. But um, so but, you know, they said, well, what, what should we invest in? You know, I said, well, 
investing doesn't always have to just look in, in assets, right? The, you don't have to just buy a piece of equipment or vehicle. You can invest in hiring that next key employee if that's a manager for you so that you can, so it could relieve some of those management tasks off of your plate. Um, so that way you can focus on selling and growing the business, then do that. And if you're going to need like a working capital loan or an SBA loan line of credit to be able to hire that employee up front, of course, because after that, once your time is freed up, you're going to be able to grow. That's a form of investment. You'll still need a loan probably, you know, to, to take this employee on. But um, it's it's different, right? It's not just in in an asset, and it becomes an expense on your profit and loss because you're going to pay them a salary, right? So, um, and you could also invest in advertising and marketing as well, um, which is also an expense on your PNL that you can deduct, and uh, a loan can be taken out for that too if. You know, you kind of bet on yourself and you know that you're going to get return on that money. So there's other investments that you can make is just knowing what your risk appetite is, kind of what you want to bet on, and then following and monitoring those numbers to make sure that you are getting a return on the investment that you made. Absolutely. And we have a question, lease versus buy. So one of the things I... I think about immediately in regard to that is how will it affect your, your cash reserve? All right. So, you know, if you have a, if you need to put a considerable down payment, um, you know, that's something you want to think about also in, in regard to, to buying, you know, how, yeah, no, like it's, there's, there's a couple different things you can think about there. Um, you know, now, as for buying um depreciation like with with lease with leases you get the you get to write off the payment that you're making each month as lease expense so that's an automatic tax write off or if you but if you purchase a piece of equipment up front then you get to write off the depreciation expense um which it's probably like the depreciation expense is a little bit more favorable because you get to write off a larger amount than lease, you know, in one year. Um, but it all equals out to be kind of like around the same amount anyway. It's just that depreciation, you get to accelerate it in the first few years if you would like. Um, and then I would say like if if it's, if it's equipment that's gonna wear and tear very easily within the first few years, then you may wanna lease it because you'll have to upgrade it anyway soon rather than buy, right? So it really just depends on um, your tax liability, kind of what services you're providing and what a piece of equipment you're using. And overhead costs. so. I think that you pr probably have a good understanding in regard to why it's probably not good to have excessive overhead costs, right? All of those costs that are not directly associated with you performing the work in the field, right? Um, so, and it may be due to maybe you're not utilizing enough technology and software. Um, maybe your team is getting a little complacent. Um, you know, maybe you're experiencing cash flow issues cash flow issues, which is, which is a typical sign for a company that has excess overhead. Um, maybe you don't have the data that should be available, you know, to your company, um, all things that, that could be leading to having excessive overhead. However, there's, there's also such thing as being too lean with your overhead. And what does that mean? It means that you're not you're, you're not supporting your operations enough. The, the overall goal of overhead and administrative expenses is to support your, your revenue generating divisions, right? Which is, you know, 
the individuals working in the field. So if, if you're too lean, if your overhead expenses are too low, then there are certain things that could be a result of that, right? So high, high employee turnover, you know, maybe people are, you know, being too overextended. They're, they're, they're doing too many things and they're not happy because they're trying to take care of too many activities and their capacity is way, way too high. Low customer satisfaction, you know, maybe because your employees don't have the time, they're, they're not spending enough time with the customers. Your customers aren't, aren't happy enough. Um, you're not able to kind of meet, meet the demand, right? Also increased errors, quality issues. And one of, one of the biggest things as well is you're not going to support growth. Typically for a company that's, that's growing faster, sometimes you, you, you may need to hire someone in the office a little bit ahead of time, or you may need to hire sales or management and to, in, in order to support growth, right? And a company that's too lean on, on overhead, it's not going to support that. So it's, it's okay to have a healthy amount of overhead. And whether it's using industry averages as a barometer, industry averages anywhere between 25 to 30 percent. Um, and the the same approach that you take when you add on overhead expenses, it typically doesn't happen overnight. Take that same approach when when you try, you know, maybe if if you do have excessive overhead, try to knock out one one percent every month, right? Focus on a few things, whether it's being more efficient with your administrative labor, whether it's getting a software that will open capacity as you grow, grow your revenue. So just thinking about a couple of, couple of those items, but, you know, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways is, you know, not, not being afraid to invest in some of the resources and activities within the administrative part of the business. That's going to help you to drive, drive revenue. And when you think about non-billable time, what a lot of people automatically go to is the field labor, right? How, how efficient is the labor being in the field, right? How many out of, out of the amount of time that's available, out of the amount of time that, that you're paying these employees, what percent of that time are, are they actually pr performing the work in the field? Right. So your non-billable time is basically the time that they're not actually producing the work. Um, now, when you look at that on an administrative function within your overhead labor, um, that's a that's a realistic met metric that you should be paying, paying attention to as well. And the administrative labor typically makes up half of your overhead costs, um, roughly. So it's, it's definitely a considerable expense. It's definitely something that, that you want to focus on and, you know, really, really make efficient processes there as well. One of the things that can, that can help is time blocking, right? Are you, um, you know, are you doing, you know, the 10 different activities kind of scattered throughout the day, or are you pairing them up, you know, because, you know, it, if it's a sales function and, you, and you're making all that calls at a certain time of day, whether it's another aspect of the business um, and, and it helps for for everything to, to flow nicely. Everything is more streamlined that way, helps to prioritize the work. Um, you can avoid some some di some distractions and it'll also allow you to track progress easier when you compare it to trying to do everything and it's scattered throughout the day. Um, and it'll show you when you start to hit capacity in certain aspects of your business as well, where, where now you had these hours that were blocked out to do a certain function. Now they're being maxed out. Okay. Do I need to hire someone in that aspect? Do I need to organize my time differently? Um, and it helps you to set, set boundaries as well, you know, and that's, that's a, that's, that's a definite reality. You know, if you're, um, if you find that, that you're having difficulty concentrating on a certain aspect, whether it's, you know, can you actually sit down and make those phone calls for accounts receivable and collections, um, you know, or something kind of distracting you or, you know, it, it helps to kind of set those boundaries there. And then, you know, 
moving out of the office, looking at, you know, we know for a maintenance company how crucial route density is, but carry those same practices along with some of the other administrative and management and sales aspects of the company. You know, try to pair the different items or if you're going out to do visits, um, you know, sales um, opportunities, um, you know, marketing opportunities, managing, you know, try to be as efficient as possible with that. Um, because remember, you're you're paying these these managers. Ideally, you're not paying them to be driving in their cars. Right. So you want to be as efficient as possible with that. Um, improve communication and standardize processes as much as possible within your overhead operations. And what 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 Colin and I believe as well is, you know, is if if you feel it's going to take a lot of time to train your um, overhead staff and administrative staff on a certain function, then may, then then it might instead be worth to to outsource that task because there's a lot of non-billable time associated with all of that training and you know all of trying to get them up to speed in regard to that specific item. Um, and uh, so definitely some 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 things to kind of think about here. And like I said, look at your administrative and overhead operations. Look at that, you know, in a way where its goal is to keep your operation running, right? Your your largest expense and largest revenue generating activity is is your direct labor working. And your company needs to do everything possible to make sure that they're set up the way that they need to be and that they're continuing to work and that that op operation is continuing to run. And that's the priority. And the more efficient that can be done, the better your company is going to end off. And this is, this is something I know, um, I know we were talking to a, talking to a client, about this as well and it and it could be um you know something that you know when you're projecting the amount of labor that you need whether you're starting your company and you're looking to hire your first couple employees whether you're starting a division a good metric to to look at is your revenue per per employee and you can look at it revenue per direct uh, field labor employee um, and understanding that just just as you look at the break-even point of your entire business, it could be surprising sometimes to see that, wow, like I, in order for me to actually make a profit, I need to make this much revenue. I need to, you know, really hit that mark. Then everything past that, you start to make a profit. And when, when, when you look at that from a revenue per employee perspective, it really helps to kind of highlight, you know, how you can be leaving money on the table. So for a, a company, like in this example, they, they may know that in order for them to be profitable out of that revenue of 1 million, they need a revenue per employee of 142,000. But maybe there's another company that has 100,000. Now that, that difference, that's actually where all the profit is built in. So just because you see, oh, wow, for, for every employee, I'm making $100,000 in, in revenue, you could actually be, be breaking even in that. So that's why it's important to always work, work backwards in regards to, okay, what's, what's your revenue goal? Then work, work your way backwards into, okay, how am I going to hit this revenue per, per, per employee mark? And it helps to really show how efficient your your operations are. A company that has a revenue per employee of 100,000, if they're providing the same kind of service to a company that has a revenue per employee of 142,000, the company that is doing 142,000 is a lot more efficient. Right? So it's it, it's a good metric that will show capacity um and it will help you to project how many hires you'll you'll need in the next six months, year, and then you know, kind of moving forward as well.
And one of the other costs that are, are kind of hidden as well is training costs. And, you know, there was this study done, you know, the cost of training a new employee was uh, $1,250, right? And that doesn't even include the cost that, or the amount that, that, that you're losing from a more senior member of your staff, not generating revenue, but instead training, right? So, um, you know, training is, is something that, and I know we kind of spoke about this um, in one of the past webinars, but when, when you're in a position where you're struggling to find the exact kind of staff that you need and, and recruit them, it makes your training process exponentially more important. So yeah, you might not be able to find the perfect candidate, but if your training process is twice as, you know, is, is twice as good as, as, as your competitors, then you're going to be at a competitive advantage over time because you're, you're going to be able to keep, keep your operation running. So, you know, and, you know, listed off some of the, uh, um, you know, some of the effects of, you know, what ineffective training can, can cause. So this is, this is definitely a hidden cost that, um, you know, you want to keep, keep your processes. If you're starting, you know, a new company or a new, new service line, you know, you have to get into the mindset of um, really trying to break it down and, and come up with processes or videos or checklists and almost pretend that someone has never worked in landscaping before or whatever service line you're in and you need to break it down for, for them like that, you know, and sometimes it's hard because you may, because you, you may be in the in industry for, for 10 years already. Right. So all of these things are second nature to you, but it's not second nature to someone that's just starting in the industry. So it's hard to, to get your mindset in that over and over again and the repetitiveness of that, but you know, it'll, it'll cost you if, if you're not training correctly, if, if you're not, um, you know, putting, putting attention to it. And some of the seasonality of, of, of this business, right. It's, you know, something that can really be be detrimental i know with with cash flow for for example you want to use this time to plan for what you're going to be doing in in the slower season right in the in the winter for for many of you um in the comments if you're working on a plan for the off season or you know i'd love to hear what what you guys do when when the season kind of slows down for you um you know whether it's Christmas lights or, um, you know, plowing snow, um, you know, maybe doing junk removal. We know a couple of companies that do that. Um, you know, we'd love to hear what, how you guys kind of mix, mix in different service lines. Um, but, but that's only one way to kind of combat this seasonality, right? You want to make sure that, that you build up a cash reserve, especially if, if you're not adding in another service line, um, you know, and those are things that you want to be thinking about now, right? You should be making a good net profit now because you're going to have to put some away in, into your cash reserves for, for the off season. Yeah. Yeah. And because it's a seasonal business during these months, you want to save more than you would in the off season. Of course, like, you know, you should be going into cash saving mode right now um and and that way you have that money to to uh cover your fixed expenses during the winter or like joe said try to make some of your fixed expenses more variable expenses so like advertising and marketing you can you can lower in the winter or um some of your merchant fees, you won't have as much revenue, so that'll go down. Workers' comp could be variable, doesn't have to be a fixed if you do uh, pay by pay. 
um, or pay as you go with with that. But those are just some examples, and maybe there are some subscriptions that you can cancel in the winter time um, that you may not be using as much for software. Um, but but yeah, I know the seasonality is changing too, um, and a lot of our uh, businesses that we work with, it's like either they had a lot of snow and they've never had that before and or they just didn't get snow and they're still in the hole till right now it's July trying to climb out because they relied so heavily on the snow. So that's why it's important not to rely on the snow and rely on something that's more predictable especially as you're trying to establish your client base there. So, yeah. And, and, and if you are, um, yeah. So, so Brian nailed it on the head, you know, the, the fixed snow contracts, right? So you're, you're taking on the, the, the expense and the liability of, of having these assets ready in case there's a snowstorm, there's a cost to that, right? So think about ways to build that into more of like an annual contract, um, you know, where you're you're basically getting, getting to the point where, um, you know, you can cover some of those fixed expenses. Um, and, uh, you know, Chris Chris mentioned, you know, they are hard to sell. And, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely something where, um, you know, it, it could be challenging and, you know, finding out ways to, um, you know, work, work with the customers and, you know, explain to them kind of the reliability of it and the value and, um, you know, what, what that means in the long term, for sure. But, uh, you know, really, really trying whatever you can. I mean, it doesn't hurt to ask or, you know, try, try some of these different moves. And inflation, I know this has been a been a huge topic right so um are you adjusting pricing right you you should i know inflation the last metrics we've looked at four to five percent still so you know you should be really um adjusting your pricing every year um and avoiding a excessive cash reserve right cash sitting around is not gonna you know it's not really doing anything for you so Invest that in other means if you're not going to be investing it back into your business. Um, and then, you know, making sure that 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 you're working capital, that you're managing that well. Because if if you're not collecting money and you're not well do, doing well with accounts receivable, that money is losing value over time. Right. So it's it's something that, you know, you want to make sure that 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 process is efficient. Yeah. You know, it's the time value of money. Your money is worth more today than it's going to be worth tomorrow, five days from now. And so it's very important to get paid up front. And also, like Joe said, with your cash, making sure that you open up a business money market account that you're making a percentage on or a savings or a CD account, or even if you have other passive income that you may or passive businesses that you may want to invest in, it's it's important. Yeah. And, you know, to kind of go along the same lines in regard to uh, pricing, right, which is a major way to, to counter some of the inflation happening, you know, make sure that that you're adding in a buffer within your pricing because they're, you know, it's 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 real life and with real life comes unexpected things, right, and, and, and delays. So you can have the most accurate pricing model and everything, right, but be, but just make sure that that you're incorporating some of that 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 buffer into your pricing as well. Um, and this is something that we had posted in the Facebook group as well. But be careful when you're providing discounts. And you can see in the graphic, you know, if if you're providing 10 percent off, what if like that has, you know, an enormous effect on on your net profit. Right. So it may just look like 10 percent. But as you can see in the graph. How much of that net profit does it actually take off, right? So it's definitely, um, you know, something you want to think about. You know, if they ask for a discount, you know, maybe there's something that you can do less. Um, maybe you could take away some of the 
um, features that you were going to put in for the backyard, right? You know, kind of work with the customer that way. Um, you know, if you're if you're bundling services, um, you know, make sure that each aspect of that bundle you're you're profitable with. Um, you know, almost similar mindset to if if you're um, you know doing maintenance and install work. Sometimes your maintenance division may not be as profitable as you want. You know, you don't truly want a loss leader, um, right? So you want to always make sure that, you know, whether you're bundling services that each is, you know, profitable for you, or if you're looking at it as a whole, you know, with service lines, um, you know, and make sure that, you know, as you're pricing out your work, you're you're recouping all, all of your costs. And, you know, here's just a simple graphic as well. And if, if you find, you know, that you're in kind of a difficult situation and you get your financials set and you can kind of see clarity into your numbers, this is a, this is kind of an advantage to that is, you know, you, you get to compare what, what goal and result you want to hit based on what your current hourly rate is. So maybe your, 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 um, maybe your hourly rate for, for a specific job is $90 an hour. But you look at your financials and you see that you only made 7% net, net profit last year. So your, your 90% rate that you thought you were going to make 50, you know, 15% profit, you actually, you know, there, there were actually other costs and other expenses going on behind the scenes that didn't make that happen, right? So how do you get to that 50% add on 8%? to that new rate, then the resulting rate is 97.2 per, per hour. So it's a, it's a quick way to, you know, make, make an adjustment if, if, if needed, um, you know, based on your numbers. And this is why it's important to keep up your numbers on a monthly basis. So you can make these changes before the end of the year happens. (laughs) Um, So just, just one thing to kind of think about. And, you know, customer retention, this is, this is another, um, you know, hidden expense as well. Um, and this can be very costly to a company. And this is why a lot of companies can't grow, you know, in reoccurring service models, like, like maintenance, lawn care. Um, and in, in this example, um, you can see that company A and company B started with the same amount of customers, which was 200 company A lost 20% of their customers. Com- company B only lost 10. So company A, they they needed to get 40 clients just to get back to that t- 200 customer mark, right? Whereas company B, they only needed to get 20 clients. Now, then, then you can see what, what the resulting... Um, expenses were to that right company a they had to acquire 40 whereas company b only had to acquire 20 to get back to that 200 mark customer mark so company a they had to spend 3000 more in comparison to company b with their cost of marketing and sales um, and 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 this is assuming 150 dollar um uh, uh cost of uh, acquiring a customer, right? Which is um, CAC or CAC. So 6,000 versus versus the 3,000, the company A, because they had to add on 40 while company B only had to add on 20, they had to incur more administrative costs and, and the revenue that was lost. So the total attrition Cost of company A $211,000. Whereas company B with only the 10% attrition only lost 105. All right. Or, or I'm sorry, they, they would have to spend only 105 to, to get back to that 200 client mark. Whereas company A would have to spend two, 211. All right. So it's, I mean, customer retention is, you know, for for a reoccurring business model within the green industry is definitely something that 
you don't want to ignore. So make sure you're tracking it and, you know, definitely focus on improving the, the experience for the customers, adding value, um, you know, in any way that, that you can to, you know, really, really improve that. And yeah, I mean, please guys, if, if you have any questions, uh, you know, ask away. Um, you know, like I said, that's, that's why we're here. And, uh, yeah. And I don't know if, um, you all know we have a Facebook group called landscaping accountant where we post on there every day, you know, tips and tricks in regard to the financial side of, of the landscaping business or green industry businesses. Um, and it's a good group. We all strive to help each other out and kind of get you thinking about different aspects of your business. And of course we always tie numbers into it and all that. So uh, feel free to join the Facebook group is called landscaping accountant. Um, has over 6,000 members in it. So some people in there who can help. Um, and yeah, but we're here. If you have any questions, uh, you know, my, my email, Carla P at cyclecpa.com, or you can call and reach out to us. Um, but yeah, any, any other questions? Yeah. I hope this helped to shed some, some light on, some of the things that maybe aren't talked about a lot, um, you know, and help to answer answer some some questions that that you guys have as well. the The webinar will be available, so I'll be sending this to everyone either tonight or uh, tomorrow morning, um, so that you have the recording and you can look through the different spots if you if you uh, had to step away or just to just to kind of review it a second time as well. All right. Well, I guess I guess we'll uh, conclude the webinar here. But it was nice seeing you guys, and uh, have a have a profitable rest of your week. <laughs> yeah. See you. Thank you, everybody. All right. See you guys.